so, yeah, my first question, why has Taiwan been so exceptional in uh, preventing the, the spread of the coronavirus? Sure, uh, because uh, everybody in Taiwan who's above 30 years old remember how bad SARS was. And so when uh, Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, gets reposted on the Taiwan social media that uh, there's seven new SARS confirmed cases, everybody gets mobilized. And so starting as early as 1st uh, January, mm. uh, January 1st, uh, we started doing health inspections for flights from Wuhan to Taiwan. So we reacted fast. Uh, and the PPE distribution was fair, <laughs> uh, and also the communication was calm and collected and you had fun. So fast, fair, fun was the main reason. Okay. So, so I've spoken to different people. Some say that it was mainly attributable to what the government did, but then other people just said that uh, people had this experience with SARS. Exactly. And, and so uh, You can look at Hong Kong. Right? Mm. They also had experience with SARS. Mm. and. Um, I wouldn't say that their trust to their government is at the same level as Taiwanese people to mm. the government, mm. but still they managed to do pretty well. Mm. Uh, and so I think social sector mobilization by far is the main reason. Mm -hmm. But even even now, I think Taiwan really stands out among all the other nations. Uh, yeah, we were officially post-COVID, right? Uh, right. We're, repurposing all the uh, digital infrastructure we use to ration the mask mm -hmm. uh, to now uh, do the triple stimulus vouchers. Mm -hmm. So we're firmly in the stimulus stage now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh, oh yeah, so then uh, describe how Taiwan has implemented con contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Sure. So it's just regular contact tracing, right? Interviews and such. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things that really help is that we have very strict border control. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you put uh, your border control, for example, the quarantine hotels mm -hmm. uh, at the border, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't need to spend extra um, personnel uh, when it goes to the community spread stage. Mm -hmm. Taiwan never entered the community spread stage, mm -hmm. and we never imposed a lockdown. Okay. And because we did very strict and early on very uh, uh, anticipated uh, what the, you hear from people is this term called advanced deployment or chao right? Mm -hmm. So we treat it as if um, everybody returning from overseas um, is sick. Mm -hmm. uh, we treat it uh, as if you know everyone who's returning citizen either go to a quarantine hotel or if they uh, have a home where they live with no vulnerable people, they can also choose to home quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also use the digital fence to make sure that their phone doesn't exceed uh, the perimeter of their home quarantine for 14 days. And just now we're very gradually starting to say, okay, so you, if you fly in from say New Zealand, uh, we're headed more or less under control, then we shorten the 14 day into five days, mm -hmm. uh, but you still have to do a RT-PCR test uh, before boarding and after the quarantine. Oh, okay. So th let me see if I understand this correctly. I, I, I believe Smartphones were also part of this contact yeah, tracing. If, if you go to the quarantine hotel, of mm. course, that's a physical quarantine, mm -hmm. but you can't leave the hotel. Mm. Uh, but if you choose to stay at home, then yes, uh, your phone, or if you don't have a phone, we hand you a phone, uh, is uh, basically the cell phone towers near you already collect the signal strength. Right. right. So if you have three cell phone towers, each knowing the distance to your phone, and you draw three circles, there's going to be one overlapping point, right. and that's where your phone is. Okay. But it's not GPS. Uh, first of all, it doesn't drain the battery. <laughs> GPS is very energy consuming. It doesn't require you to install any app. Mm -hmm. It's the data that the cell phone operators are already collecting anyway. Right. And finally, uh, it has a uh, precision roughly 50 meters uh, in urban areas. Uh, in GPS, we would know exactly which room mm -hmm. you're in, yeah. in, in your home, and that's like too much information. We don't need that mm. information. Mm. We just need to know whether you have broken out of the quarantine or not. If you choose to stay in the quarantine, we pay you, I think, 33 US dollars per day mm -hmm. as stipend. Mm -hmm. But if you break it, it's 1,000 times that as a fine. Mm. Okay. So how, how does this contrast with, I don't know if you're familiar with what was done in Israel, mm -hmm. but uh, there, there was some sort of Israel recently revealed that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, hey, we've been, we've been using smartphones mm -hmm. to track people to prevent terrorism, mm -hmm. and we're now using the same technology to. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same use. Okay. In Taiwan, uh, the kind of geofence or what we call digital fence mm. uh, is used for two cases that people are familiar. Mm. One is for earthquake. 
if you are in a place where uh, there's a high risk of landslide or whatever, mm. uh, as soon as earthquake happens, actually before the earthquake actually gets felt, mm. uh, you will receive uh, this uh, cell broadcast, mm. like a SMS message mm. that tells you to evacuate, basically. Mm. Uh, or uh, when typhoon comes, if you're in a place with a high chance of flood, uh, then people in that area also receive an SMS. So people already um, get into the habit of receiving the kind of pro public service announcements for uh, specific areas uh, of uh, population. And so the geofencing in the digital fence works similarly, mm -hmm. but it works basically by defining the rest of Taiwan, you know, other than your home, mm -hmm. uh, as a dangerous area. Mm -hmm. So once you break out of it, not only you, but also your household manager or the police receive the SMS. But it's the same idea. So there's no extra data collection, no apps need to be installed, and it's very transparent. People understand that once the 14-day quarantine is over, there's no constitutional basis for us to keep track of your whereabouts. Okay. And so it's both space-limited and also time-limited. Okay. So I think that pretty that explains pretty much how privacy is protected. Yeah. And if you don't like the digital fence, you can choose to go to a hotel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And so what areas of government are you involved in? Mm -hmm. In what ways do you help to shape policy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I'm in charge of three things. Uh, one is called social innovation. For example, when there's people who said, oh, um, I would like to visualize how many masks are available around my vicinity. Uh, and that's social innovation because the government didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. It's the people, right? So I'm uh, in charge of amplifying their idea, mm -hmm. trusting citizens with open data, ensuring the social innovation can continue mm -hmm. to become essentially digital infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, these tools, more than 140, um, enjoys more than, I think, 10 million users. Uh, and altogether of 23 million people in Taiwan, more than 21 million have collected using their national health insurance card, uh, the ration mask. So it's a, it's a big success, more than 90% of people uh, mm -hmm. have done so. Uh, the rest, maybe they already have some mask uh, in, in their store. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would instead use another app to uh, basically dedicate their uncollected mask quota to international humanitarian aid. Uh, so that's another thing, right? Mm. So these are social innovation because they start from the civil society. Mm. Uh, so that's one of my job. Okay. Uh, the other job of mine is called open government. It's the other way around. Is the government responding to uh, people's ideas saying, okay, now we have a consultation. We would like you to uh, suggest ways that are privacy enhancing that doesn't hurt the privacy while helping to manage the COVID. So for example, we run the COHAC, which stands for Coronavirus Hackathon or Collaboration Hackathon, your choice. But at COHAC.tw, it's a joint Taiwan-US uh, statement to counter coronavirus. So we invite uh, lots of teams around the world to vote on the ideas that conforms to the local norm that people feel they're comfortable uh, in implementing. So out of the open government work came, for example, uh, the idea that people can use their phone to track their own whereabouts, but it doesn't sense through Bluetooth or 4G or 5G or whatever. Uh, it keeps strictly in the phone. Mm -hmm. So it uh, works only for you. And the reason why for that is called Lockboard, one of the winners of the co Hackathon, the open government work, is that be because people feel if it serves their own best interest, then they're willing to track their whereabouts. And once the contact tracer come to them, it generates this one-time link mm -hmm. that the contact tracer know exactly the kind of information that medical officers need without divulging the privacy details of their friends and families as a traditional contact tracing interview would reveal. So it's a privacy protecting tool. Mm -hmm. So that's open government uh, where we ask for consultations and ideas. And finally, I'm also in charge of youth engagement in, in which uh, each of the ministries uh, in charge of social innovation, uh, like 12 of them hire, uh, really not hire, a point uh, to reverse mentors, people who are under 35 years old, who are their um, social entrepreneurs, social innovators, uh, that leads the ministry's direction, suggesting, for example, uh, the World Skills Competition champions should be treated like Olympic athletic uh, champions on the National Day Parade, and also uh, teaching like uh, high schools people so that they choose um, uh, high schools specializing in techni technical um, expertise as their first choice instead of just uh, academic uh, high schools as their first choice. That's a really good idea and it's implemented through the Youth Council uh, that uh, basically has the Premier as the head 
that translates these young people's directions into feasible uh, government plans. That's my third uh, portfolio. Hmm. So uh, just stepping back a bit, um, this open government initiative is actually a collaboration with uh, people all over the world. Not, that's not right, just that's right, that's right. Yeah, Taiwan is just one of the, the fields uh, mm-hmm. that we work. I'm a digital minister uh, in Taiwan, but I'm also a board member of three international NGOs uh, furthering open government work, mm-hmm. Digital Future Society, um, also Radical Exchange Foundation, the Council Foundation in Amsterdam, and so on. So we see uh, us as a kind of coalition of the willing, <laughs> coalition of liberal democracies uh, that uh, look to uh, basically make democracy grow stronger during the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, to make a more um, like real-time democracy instead of vote every four years democracy mm-hmm. uh, and we use the pandemic as an amplifier for people to feel that oh that we're all stakeholders uh, mm-hmm. in this country coronavirus way. Hmm. So I've spoken to other people other NGOs here in Taiwan mm-hmm. uh, actually it seems to me that's one of Taiwan's strongest expressions of soft power. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it, it's interesting to me that you're, you're also part of that uh, Yeah, of effort. course. Yeah, uh, if you spoke to, for example, the Taiwan Association for Human Rights, the THR, they will gladly tell you that Taiwan is the only jurisdiction in Asia that enjoys the completely open rating from the Civicus Monitor in terms of the freedom to assemble, freedom of speech, freedom of journalism, and things like that. And even if you count Asia Pacific, I think Taiwan and New Zealand are the only two, hmm. uh, which means that not only the reporter with Without Borders have their Asian headquarters here, hmm. that also the Freedom Forum uh, uh, set up their annual conference here twice now, hmm. uh, and also uh, the journalists that got um, uh, invited out uh, from PRC and, yeah. and Hong Kong and the international NGOs nowadays um, just choose Taiwan as their headquarters because really there is nowhere else that has a more free civil society. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I, I would actually like to talk to more NGOs uh, uh, just to get a better sense sure, of, of, of what Taiwan is doing in that area. Um, so how do you actually help to shape policy then uh, here in, in Taiwan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as I said, uh, through open government, okay. that is to say the public consultations and hackathons, okay. through social innovation, that is to say people who have a great idea, I just show it to our premier, mm. uh, saying that we really need to support that, okay. uh, and that's that. And also youth engagement, these are the three main ways that I should policy. Okay. Uh, and each ministry related to social innovation, uh, around 12 of them, uh, have secondment in my office. Okay. So uh, on your way in, you are probably already passed the secondment from the ministries of interior, of culture, of communication, of justice, of finance, uh, I'm missing a few, uh, foreign service, and, and so on. And so basically they agree to work out loud, mm-hmm. meaning that they work in a very horizontal leadership way. Mm-hmm. I don't give them scoring or rating or whatever, uh, but they uh, work on cross-ministerial issues kind of autonomously. Okay. So, uh now, now, I know another initiative of yours is to make government transparent, but right. should, should a government be totally transparent? I, I mean... Yeah, it, I think government should be radically transparent, and radical, I mean, at the root. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for example, my meeting with journalists, uh, I agree to uh, publish this video uh, after you do. Mm-hmm. So I can embargo until your story runs. Oh, okay. So it's not like we live stream everything. Mm-hmm. Or if you choose to uh, have a textual transcript, you can go back and edit away the typos or add some references. It's all okay, mm-hmm. as long as you don't touch my part mm-hmm. <laughs> of, of words. So uh, it basically, it flips the default. It makes radical transparency, makes um, transparency the default, and you have to do some extra work to red act mm-hmm. or to take away some anecdotes that you hear from your friend who have not cleared it for publication and so on. So all of this is allowed, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, radical transparency makes the transparency the default. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I mean, certainly there are some areas in which government needs to be confidential also, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, sure. And then you have 10 days, or in case of your uh, public servant, you have 10 working days mm-hmm. to edit those out. Okay, okay. All right. Um, okay, so I, th- I think you've explained pretty well how Taiwan has successfully mm-hmm. implemented transparency, but are there 
Are there some other areas which you think more effort needs to be made, mm -hmm. perhaps? Yeah, sure. Uh, in the parliament, they just started their own open government uh, network, uh, opening up the parliament, which is a, a very good uh, development. Because we in the administration, you know, is the uh, we are making ourselves transparent to the people uh, and also to the MPs. But we sh could not ask the MP to be transparent to us, right? That would be <laughs> a reversal of constitutional roles. But if the MPs and all, I think all four parties uh, there or, or five uh, or or more, but anyway, uh, all the different parties in Parliament agree, no matter what their ideologies are, that uh, open government is their kind of shared value, uh, and so they have their their own coalition of the open government uh, partnership inspired multi-stakeholder uh, uh, forum to make themselves more open. And you see already the same uh, happening to the justice, to the courts as well. Uh, in Taiwan, we're in the next few years gradually uh, introducing juries, that is to say participating uh, citizens, which will again open up the field of the judges. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just not uh, something that the administration can do it alone. We need support from other branches as well. Right. Oh, so could, could you explain at what stage each of these different uh, efforts are? At sure, this sure. Point? Yeah, so um, I think for the open justice uh, part, there's a lot of mock uh, trials uh, already uh, involving participatory citizens, like mock juries. Uh, and I think they're now working on the kind of final uh, legalization required uh, to, to make that a reality. I think the goal is to implement it within Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's second term. Uh, and for open parliament, again, they just passed a resolution uh, before the end of the previous session. So we'll see a lot more activity in the next session. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean to the typical citizen in Taiwan? If, yeah. if they want to see mm -hmm. any sort of judicial proceedings mm -hmm. or legislative proceedings yeah, online? Yes, they yes can exactly. They can do that. For example, uh, for <coughs> unsafe driving, uh, which is a very popular thing, driving under influence, uh, DOI, there's many people who would question uh, why do the judge uh, rule so lightly mm. on this um, DOI incident. Mm. Uh, funny how people don't ask why they judge so strongly. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, so and so because of that, uh, the uh, court, uh, the what we call the judicial yuan, uh, the judicial branch, developed this assistive intelligence and AI that basically lets you click uh, any driving under influence case and it analyzes to you using natural language parsing which part of the persecution corresponds to which clauses in the driving under mm. uh, influence uh, rule. Uh, and so that results in this sentencing. Uh, and you can try it out and compare how similar uh, like th these different cases are. And so instead of explaining over and over again, why do we judge this way or that way, it's actually also very useful for judges. So who can see how this case compares to every other cases. Of course, they can always override the assistive intelligence, but then they have to specify why. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that is a really good case in which that assistive intelligence really lowered the, the kind of everyday chore uh, of the public servants. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. So, okay. Now, I think this probably is a bit more difficult question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hopefully I'm not giving you too, no, questions that are too, too easy. <laughs> Uh, but uh, how good is Taiwan cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, as a, as a digital, as a hacker yourself, uh, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, we're, we're, we're sitting here, it means it's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> um, it's battle tested. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it, it's very interesting because in Taiwan, uh, the white hat uh, hacker community mm -hmm. is very active, mm -hmm. um, just as our civic hacker uh, community is active. Mm -hmm. uh, I think last year they won the second place uh, in the international DEF CON CTF, the kind of like annual Olympic level uh, contest. Um, Th this was DEF CON in the US? Yeah, oh, okay. DEF CON CTF. Okay. Uh, they won second place uh, next only to the US team. I mm -hmm. think this year maybe we win, but anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but uh, in any case, the point is that the white hat hackers in Taiwan is considered both a prestigious, as in they're like, mm, I, I don't know, defenders of, of our um, island, and also paid very well. Because we made sure that for each government project, uh, 5 to 7% of all IT budget goes to cybersecurity alone. Uh, like penetration testing, threat hunting, private saving, and so on. And in the next four years, we're expanding that to five to seven percent of the total. 
budget, mm -hmm. which is uh, even more, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a white hat hacker, you get paid well, you have a lot of uh, chance to meet with the president or the minister, um, and also um, you get recognized uh, for your work and to uh, make sure that young people uh, learn about all these ethical hacking things so mm -hmm. they don't fall to the dark side, which has more cookies. So these people are the white hat hackers are contractors uh, mm -hmm. working for the government or how yeah some work? of them uh, decided to contract and work for the government uh, some of them uh, started their own company like Trend Micro uh, is actually quite oh, famous right. yeah, uh, really in, internationally I never thought of them as white hat hackers they are white hat hackers okay <laughs> yeah uh, they they do they do prevention they do forensics they they even do disinformation analysis okay. uh, they also have a chatbot called Dr. Message uh, that's can uh, look at uh, trending rumors on the line platform. Mm -hmm. uh, if you forward it to them or invite a bot to your chat room, it does what antivirus does best, which is scan each incoming message. And if it sh uh, sees something like a scam or a um, you know uh, disinformation package, it just says right there that this is virus detected, <laughs> disinformation detected, and so on. So uh, the private sector is very important in keeping the cybersecurity branding. Um, so making sure that everyday people, uh, just like they trust a antivirus company, they would also learn about good uh, information hygiene, so to speak, so that those uh, scams or those uh, disinformation packages won't have a R value over one, meaning that people wouldn't spread it to other people, uh, that it could um, be contact traced, <laughs> and that's called uh, cybersecurity attribution, uh, and, and hunt it down. Okay, uh, so Trend Micro, I think, is based in Japan. Uh, that that there's no conflict of interest with them being in Japan, but doing work for. Well, there's some investors and some developers in Japan, but Trend Micro started as a Taiwanese company. Yes, yes, yeah. I know that. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so there have been several serious hacking incidents this year, mm -hmm. uh, from some of the reports I read, even some. Confidential documents were, you know, in inside the central government were were lost. Really? Yeah. Oh, so you're you're not aware of that? What? <laughs> I, you mean I, the presidential office? Yes. I, uh, I, okay. I, I thought yeah. one. I think one report I read said that uh, what uh, the personal details on uh, mm -hmm. you know Taiwan citizens were were mm -hmm. hacked and and. Uh, it was long ago, though. Oh, it was long ago. It was long ago. Um, the, the news, though, was new. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and I think it, it's very interesting. How, how long ago was that, by the way? I think it's around 2008, oh, okay. 2009, okay. something like that. Okay. Uh, because it, it's, a, it's a very old copy, uh, and it's probably not from a government database. No. Uh, it could be uh, from multiple sources. Uh, the format um, is like very chaotic it came from various different uh, okay. sources as woven together and in, in in any case it's not news to to us uh, so it's very interesting how um, the, the press how kind of rediscover uh, that uh, I think it's interesting because it compares I think to the presidential office which is again not office document it's more like personal notes mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the presidential office, and it's not this, the carbon copy of the personal note either. It's been um, adjusted okay. uh, strategically and sent to, to journalists. And, and so all, all this, um, there's no kind of single incident that uh, gives these results. Rather, it's more like a kind of media operation that they want to, I, I don't know, scare Taiwanese people, maybe? Okay, okay. okay. So there... I'm, I'm sure you're aware of these reports uh, that said that uh, what a lot of even state-run companies like uh, what uh, Zhonghua Telecom, mm, yeah, the you know, CHT, mm -hmm. uh, um, so on and so forth, they they were all they were also under these cyber attacks mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. during this year. I, I think it was prior to uh, to uh, President Tsai's um, the beginning of her second term of office. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you are aware of those incidents. I mean, did they actually happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it's been going on for a very long time, though. Um, because, for example, the, the, the so-called um, uh, household uh, data that you just referred to, uh, the vast majority uh, is from before 2004. Okay. Uh, and from 2005 to 2008, 
uh, there's been, uh, according to our investigation people, there's been 30 uh, new data inserted in. Uh, and so it's just, I, I don't know how to put it, but I, I think the main point is that it's been going on for a very long time. Right. This is what we call advanced persistent threat, mm. or APT. Mm. Uh, so while the majority was before 2004, uh, from time to time they add just a few uh, items mm -hmm. uh, that they somehow managed to get okay. uh, and to kind of keep refreshing mm. uh, this memory uh, of uh, you know Taiwanese um, personal data being circulated on dark web and things like that and mm. so <clears throat> I think um, a lot of it though I think is just to create a, a atmosphere of unease mm. of anxiety mm. more than anything mm. uh, instead of hard cyber attack I think this is more like in the multi information uh, area okay so what is it fair to say then that uh, Taiwan's cy cybersecurity now is stronger? It's better than two thousand four. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Um, all right, because I, I've also heard people say that uh, Taiwan is sort of like a laboratory uh, for these hacks coming from from China. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a, a fairly constant thing. That that's what I mean by battle tested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So those, yeah, uh, those, there's been no de decrease in those attacks, right? Yeah, there's been no decrease, but again, I think uh, because of the white hat hacker community in Taiwan, they don't have to do exercises or drills, right? They face real thing uh, every day. So that also prompts us to have a strong cybersecurity culture. And also, if you liken it to kind of personal hygiene, like using soap to wash your hands and mm. things like that, mm. uh, two-factor authentication and things like that, mm. uh, it makes it the, the norm to mm. do so. And uh, a, a lapse in that, of course, sometimes causes um, minor um, community cases, but it never really evolved into community transmission, mm. uh, like in the critical infrastructure it doesn't uh, affect the uh, operation side the operation technology because we design already with these in mind uh, and most of the core infrastructure doesn't even connect to the internet okay what about some of these privately run companies though like TSMC apparently they're also they're, they're part of crypto in infrastructure too yeah. okay yeah and uh, their um, MIS their information management um, also have a lot of uh, really good white hat hackers in uh, I know because TM TSMC SMC poached one white hat hacker from my office oh, <laughs> to <okay>. TSMC. <laughs> how, how long ago was that? Uh, it was a year or so ago. A year or so ago. <laughs> okay. So apparently their their cybersecurity is also fairly good. Because yeah, I, and, and they have to, I mean by law, because uh, TSMC is classified as part of our critical infrastructure. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if I remember several years ago there was, uh, what, some of their... their Equipment was affected by some sort of a, a worm, uh, I believe. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that that did have some impact on their. I think they had to shut down. Yeah, I production. think, but I think it was contained very quickly. Okay. Yeah, so it's not like we're totally invincible to attack, but the idea of defense and depth is that as soon as you um, notify that um, happens, uh, first you do a notification to the core coordinated uh, reporting system, the CERT. Uh, on the other hand, they have a business resilience plan. For example, they would unplug the internet cables and continue uh, to do plan B uh, work, which keeps its normal work running, obey as a, um, I guess, uh, a reduced efficiency, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not like uh, end of the world. Okay, all right. So how does uh, is there anything that Taiwan needs to do to prevent future cyber attacks? Well, I think uh, one of the main things we're working on, as I said, is just to increase the budget. Uh, if every government agency see that when they're uh, procuring, uh, they're not adding cybersecurity as some extra item after, uh, but rather they use penetration testing as a norm. 
uh, when I become digital minister, uh, I set up this system called Sandstorm uh, that allows cross-departmental document sharing, uh, spreadsheet sharing, and so on. And we ask the top hackers, the, the one that got the second place uh, in the DEF CON CDF, uh, to attack the system. Uh, it's open source. So it's white box text testing for six months. And they filed three CVs, three vulnerabilities, and finally concluded, okay, it's safe. Right, so we need to make this a habit, and this is not just for a virtual system. For example, in the self-driving uh, testing ground uh, in Shaolin, right, uh, we also hosted this grand challenge to invite white hat hackers to make sure that nobody can, I, I guess, remote control those self-driving vehicles into killing machines or something. Mm -hmm. uh, to making sure that uh, that physical infrastructure is uh, also safe uh, before we allow any testing on that proof of ground. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I saw some of the. I I had to kind of rub my eyes when I saw these self-driving vehicles uh, in that area. How how soon is that going to to start? It, it's running now. Oh, is uh, it in, in the Shinyi dedicated bus line? Was oh, that right? Yeah, it, it's just it's not picking up passengers yet mm -hmm. because uh, I think there's two models. One with nine people, one with thirty-five people, mm -hmm. uh, and they work after the metro closed. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a pseudo self-driving metro, mm -hmm. uh, and they're now. Um, training those uh, assistive intelligence to get familiar mm. with the road of Taipei mm. uh, and soon uh, once they're uh, reasonably familiar uh, then people will be able to take on those buses. Oh. So, uh, so how, how soon will that be? I think before end of the year. It, will that be a, a world's first? Uh, probably not the world's first, uh, but in Taiwan there's many uh, world's first, so uh, there's also self-driving boats uh, I think in, in Kaohsiung and also um, self-driving uh, drones that's already everywhere. <laughs> okay. So when we do our self-driving vehicle uh, testing sandbox act, we did not distinguish uh, between uh, different modes. It could be something that's on water and then flies or goes on the road or whatever. It could be multimodal. Uh, and all of these are now uh, under testing. And many of them require 5G mm -hmm. uh, to properly work mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, collision prevention, vehicle to vehicle communication, and so on. I think by tomorrow, uh, two of the many major telecoms will announce the general 5G availability. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I. Okay, now I know this is kind of, this is not on the list of questions, but okay, sure. um, right, I mean, I see a lot of uh, Chinese made equipment in, in Taiwan, like mm -hmm. uh, Huawei equipment, ZTE mm -hmm. equipment, mm -hmm. it is... Uh, Hopefully not in our offices though. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a concern though? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, could... Could, could yeah. that be a weakness? It's a, it's a, it's a debate we had uh, when we occupied the parliament uh, in 2014. Uh, in the Sunflower, more than 20 NGOs each debated one aspect of the cross-trade service and trade agreement, or the CSST, and one of them uh, debated whether we need to allow PRC components in our 4G infrastructure. And the uh, result, everybody knows it by now, is no, right? We, we do not allow PRC components in the base stations, mm. in the basic infrastructures. Right. But also, people do doesn't feel that uh, handheld devices that suit their phones at that time was a big threat. Because if you secure the core infrastructure, there's very limited damage what a phone could do. And that was kind of the rough consensus at the time. Uh, of course, later on, um, Huawei would get into trouble with NCC because uh, in their firmware update, they insist calling Taiwan you know, Taiwan province of China or something like that. Mm. But that's another thing yes. altogether, mm. right? So uh, our strategy is just to keep the infrastructure safe. Uh, and then in the public sector, of course, we do not uh, procure PRC components. But in the economic sector where the damage is negligible if they're not in critical infrastructures, at the moment there's no outright ban. Okay, all right. And so then, what I think you explained already quite a bit about Taiwan's coder culture, which is kind of a surprise to me because mm -hmm. I've I've always kind of perceived of Taiwan as more sort of a hardware mm -hmm. place. Uh, I know uh, our, our best software engineers gets conscripted into working for hardware firms. <laughs> yeah. So so what what is the coder culture like here in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, in the recent years there's been a lot of uh, change. Um, I think assistive intelligence or AI really play a large part. Uh, that's when the SMEs suddenly see that they can do a digital transformation and instead of kind of saving money amortized somewhere down the line, uh, they can just save money immediately by automating a lot of their chores on QA work, on automation work and things like that with very little programming required. It's basically just a um, assistive intelligence apprentice uh, observing their senior uh, staff uh, working. And so for that, the digital transformation, there's a lot of people kind of freed up from uh, this hardware industry now working with the MISMEs uh, to do digital transformation. Uh, even, for example, some internationally known people like Ethan Du, uh, the person who was in charge of the Cortana uh, AI in the Microsoft um, ecosystem, uh, moved back to Taiwan to start the AI labs. Uh, to explore uh, human-computer interaction, medical uses, um, a lot of uh, the pandemic, counter-pandemic uh, uses of AI that was pioneered by the AI lab. Uh, the gold card visa also helped. Uh, I think the founder, uh, one of the founders of YouTube uh, is also uh, now back to Taiwan using gold card and so on. So we're seeing an influx of pure software people uh, working with the hardware ecosystem to work on what we call sensory fusion projects that requires uh, for example in a self-driving vehicle you need the optics the acoustics the lidar or whatever to work very closely together and that often uh, requires computation at the edge that is to say on the vehicle instead of in the cloud because that would be too, too late mm -hmm. and TSMC of course can do whatever chip you design uh, for that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very good integrated uh, supply chain, uh, not only the peripherals, the optics, the chips, and so on, but also uh, people specializing in interaction design, industrial design, and so on. All of these people are now go going back to Taiwan, sometimes uh, accidentally, because they were just here for the Lunar New Year, and then they find there's nowhere as safe as Taiwan, so they stay. So, so, so that was sort of an indirect impact of, of the coronavirus. Yeah, definitely. I, I meet a lot of people who kind of accidentally, you know, just go back to visit their parents and then wait, where am I going? I'm not going anywhere. Uh, and then started to to really think about how they can contribute to Taiwan. Wow, that, that's fantastic. I. I I really love to meet some of these people. Yeah, of if, you, if you could help of introduce course. me to them, of I, yeah, yeah. That'd be good. Uh, because that, that, I think that's one. I mean, okay, I've covered the hardware industry for you know so many years, and so I, I've always had this perception of you know this is a very you know manufacturing oriented sort of uh, industry here, right? Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. So it's interesting to hear that. You know, we now have this sort of uh, mm -hmm. coder culture that is. Yeah, is, you, you, is you can talk to uh, a recent winner of Cohack, right? I talked about Lockboard, where uh, you keep your whereabouts in the phone. Uh, and there's someone, another team called Autonomy, uh, that does that on a community scale, community level. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, person leading that effort is called Sean Mospultz, mm -hmm. uh, and he runs Bitmark uh, in Taiwan. Uh, but uh, I think he's American, uh, and uh, he and his co-founders and their friends are now trapped in the bubble, uh, but they said it's a good bubble to be trapped in. <laughs> So maybe I can introduce you to Sean. You can have a chat. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. I would love that. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, you've introduced some of these people. So w what about the LGBT scene in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, we're going to have a pride physically. I think the only one in the world. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I read that. Uh -huh. So that when, when is that going to be? So um, it's, it's a series of events, right? The municipal governments, uh, the various different uh, NGOs and so on, they have a, a series of um, events. I think there's, um, well, lot, actually they, they start today <laughs> uh, and, and continues for quite some time. And um, a lot of, so um, yeah, the, the news, I was just reading the news, it says uh, nearly 500 other events globally have been canceled. Uh, and so a lot of energy has been pouring in uh, into the, the, the Pride. Uh, so there's, of course, the Global Pride online, uh, but there's also, um, the according to the Taiwan Gay Sports Association, um, the 
the Global Pride Family celebration is on Sunday, which was yesterday, uh, and then uh, continued with a lot of live streaming extra against that there was not fine. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so how has this opening to the LGBT community here really changed society in Taiwan? Well. Uh, in two ways. Uh, one, I think uh, people after the two referenda and one constitutional ruling uh, really see that our very innovative, I must say, uh, legalizing the bylaws but not the in laws or in Mandarin, mm -hmm. uh, it's very creative mm -hmm. right? because for Taiwanese people who married before 2007, mm -hmm. uh, it could be by social ceremony, meaning that it's a matter between two families. But after 2008, it's by registration only, which means it's between two individuals. Mm -hmm. And this is called Hun and that is called Yin. Mm -hmm. right? And so when we did the legalization a year or so ago, um, we legalized a hyperlink act that basically says for uh, you know same-sex marriage, uh, they hyperlink to every part of the civil code that says the when the rights and duties of individuals, mm -hmm. but it doesn't link to any part of the civil code that talks about families. Mm -hmm. So their fam families don't wed, okay. uh, their individuals wed. Okay. Uh, and so this is very interesting because this kind of is something both generations can live with. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't disrupt the, the um, I don't know, eight different pronouns um, <laughs> <laughs> that we use for aunts and uncles. <laughs> Not really pronoun, proper nouns that we use for aunts and uncles, but it does uh, protect the same rights and duties okay. uh, of the, the newlyweds. Uh, and so I think this really have a um, spirit in Taiwan uh, after the legalization that both sides feel, oh, uh, the things that we cherish, which is marriage itself, uh, is being taken care of. Mm -hmm. uh, the family to family value is preserved. Mm -hmm. The individual rights is also being protected. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think the approval rate of same sex marriage grew by like 10% mm -hmm. uh, between the legalization and now, mm -hmm. proving that this is not a kind of majority over minority thing, mm -hmm. but rather it's something that we can all live with. That's mm -hmm. the first. Mm -hmm. And the second is that it, it creates a, uh, it, at least in East Asia, a, a really good uh, precedence for other jurisdictions to yes. look up to. Yes. Right? Just as in, in South Korea, uh, they said, oh, Taiwan published a mask pharmacy map every 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Why cannot our government do that? Mm -hmm. And they managed to convince their government to do exactly that yes. um, in um, Thailand, in Japan, across the whole of Asia. We have activists uh, now telling us that this uh, legalizing the bylaw and not the in laws may just be the ticket. Uh, and so the Taiwan model is spreading. So that's also useful internationally. That also helps to build recognition of Taiwan. Yes, right? of course. Right, right. Um, yeah, this is kind of a personal thing, but I've always felt like inclusiveness is, is kind of a, it, it's something that President Tsai uh, pushed when she first became president. You yeah, know? yeah, she had this famous quote uh, in her inauguration speech yeah. saying that, you know, before democracy was showdown between opposing values, but from now on democracy must become conversation between diverse values. And, and she is really good at making sure that we take all the sides yes. when designing uh, these major policy reforms. Right, right, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time here. I, I know you're kind of busy. 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, so are you working with the, pro I know you were involved uh, during the Sunflower mm -hmm. movement with uh, the people in Hong Kong, yeah. but are you are you still working with these protesters in, mm -hmm. in Hong Kong now? Many of them actually visited me, uh, either physically or digitally, uh, in the past few months um, due to um, generally known circumstances uh, and many of them uh, are very delighted uh, when they see uh, a week or so ago that uh, our government under President Tsai Ing-wen's direction uh, have this uh, dedicated office and hotline uh, for protection of Hong Kong people uh, if they want to seek asylum or if they want to seek a platform on which to speak to international media uh, and things like that, uh, we're happy to help, Taiwan is here to help. Mm -hmm. So. That that's the main form of, of support that you're providing to these people in, in Hong Kong? Well, also hosting Oslo Freedom Forum, uh, hosting the Reporter Without Borders, uh, making sure that their stories are told truthfully, uh, and any journalist in, in Taiwan can report however they want without uh, worrying they would be invited out. You know. <laughs> 
So, is there any other way that the uh, government here is supporting the bee water movement in, in Hong Kong? Mm-hmm. Well, I think bee water starts from Hong Kong. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a uh, Li Xiaolong thing, right? It's a Bruce right. Lee thing. <laughs> right. uh, but it's, it's, we, we see it everywhere in the world now. I, I think the people in Barcelona quote bee water. Uh, and pretty much everybody in the world now will have heard of how this leaderless movement work. Uh, could see that it's a, a new stage of uh, protests. Mm-hmm. I, I know Extinction Rebellion also use some of those uh, tactics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, even alternative parties like Autonivet uh, in Denmark and so on, they're, they're all, I wouldn't say imitate, I would say they're learning from the Be Water ethos uh, and basically become a hashtag. And once a movement become a hashtag, it's leaderless, right? You can't confiscate a hashtag or, or imprison the hashtag because it's just an idea. Um, I, I don't understand how that works though. I mean, I think it's a, a brilliant idea, uh, but how do you have a leaderless movement, mm-hmm. right? Well, well, hashtag me too is a great example. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you see hashtag me too, um, like I, I for one cannot recall who first used that hashtag, but I, I know what that means. Uh, and hashtag Black Lives Matters now uh, have a very similar structure. I mean, there's ostensibly leaders, mm-hmm. but there's like just in Hong Kong, there are leaders. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are people who make uh, music like Make Glory Be to Hong Kong and so mm-hmm. on. Uh, but they do so by co creation. They do so uh, allowing uh, remixes. They relinquish most of the copyright anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that each generation. Uh, and I mean generation in a very fast iteration sense, I don't mean 20 years, maybe 20 seconds uh, after they publish it on internet platforms, uh, people start to remix and make more potent memes uh, on top of those hashtags. Mm. And that's how we see those very trending hashtags being created. You can see the same uh, involving Taiwan with uh, the Milk Tea Alliance uh, hashtag. You can see it in the Viva Taiwan hashtag. Uh, there's a lot of hashtag structure like that. Okay. But for example, if you if you wanted to, or- to organize a protest or something like that, how, yeah, how you, do you, you have think a- of a good hashtag? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then everybody organizes under uh, underneath that. That's hashtag. right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my main hashtag, as you can see, is called Taiwan Can Help. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Then what, what are your personal aspirations? What, what what are you what do you see yourself doing mm-hmm. maybe five years from now, ten years from now? Exactly as, as now. Okay. Right? Building common values out of different positions. And also when something really needs uh, to be done and nobody seems to be doing it, well I still have some programming chops, I guess. I can do that mm. myself as a civic hacker. Mm. Um, I changed, for example, the uh, translation, uh, one word really, a uh, typo uh, in the Japan Stop COVID dashboard for the Tokyo Metropolis. Uh, and that was me as a GitHub contributor, not me as a digital minister. Mm-hmm. All right? And the uh, code for Japan, kind of their equivalent to Cup Zero, um, Haluseki Song, the, the leader, tweeted it, and the city council tweeted it, and then the mayor of Tokyo tweeted it, uh, as if this is somehow, you know, trick one diplomacy. But this is really digital or track zero mm. uh, diplomacy. Mm. So I still do that from time to time, uh, kind of as a hobby. Mm-hmm. But most of the time I spend my time listening to different stakeholders and try to build common value out of different positions. Okay. So does that mean you, you I mean, you're working in the private sector or the public sector in the future, or maybe both? Uh? No, uh, obviously both, right? Mm. I work primarily in the social sector. Mm. Uh, the people, Okay, right. Right, <laughs> the, the people who voluntarily uh, see injustices in the world and try to uh, come up with innovations uh, that makes it less bad uh, or a lot better. Uh, but the economic sector, of course, can amplify these, like Google supported the mask map. Uh, the public sector, again, can support the necessary open data and so on. But it's for first and foremost social sector. Okay, right. So then what, what are your aspirations for Taiwan? So um, the Jade Mountain Savia, the tip of Taiwan, uh, the peak 
grows by two or three centimeter every mm -hmm. year mm -hmm. uh, toward the sky, mm -hmm. uh, and that is because the tectonic plates. Yes. Uh, and and I think this is very uh, symbolic. Or not at all symbolic. If you go to the Taroko Gorge, you get to see that in action. Uh, so uh, the two plates uh, that bump into each other all the time uh, both creates earthquakes, forcing us to be resilient mm. uh, and force us to look at things from a higher vantage point. Mm. And I think this is what I call transculturalism, mm. uh, which is we in Taiwan with more than 20 national languages, including the sign language, which has become very popular thanks to the um, daily press conferences. Uh, they, they all enjoy equal say uh, in shaping the future of Taiwan, which is growing upward uh, toward the sky. Okay. So then that's very uh, abstract, though, I think, right? Uh, but yeah, but, but that's, that's uh, what liberal democracy is all about. Mm -hmm. It is being open to possible futures. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a top-down, like we do a 10-year plan, mm -hmm. right? This is what whatever uh, people think of today. We translate that into national-scale innovation tomorrow or next year. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, do you ever, I mean... A lot of the people I've spoken to, of course, talk about independence for Taiwan. People say, well, it already is independent. Yeah, you know, it's, since the Neolithic it's not, it's age. Not, it's not really something we need yeah. to... Since the Neolithic age. Yes. <laughs> right. I heard that comment from yeah. you before. <laughs> that was that was brilliant. <laughs> I love that. It is a geological fact. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there, there's no point really in, in overemphasizing, uh, you know, Taiwan becoming... Uh, well, I think internationally, it's very important that people, I think after the marriage equality, after milk tea, uh, after now uh, the Taiwan model, uh, less and less people confuse us with Thailand. Uh, not, not, that, not, not that I have anything against Thailand, I've been in Thailand many times, and they also have bu uh, milk tea there, and also bubble tea. But in any case, the point is that um, Taiwan as a, a brand, internationally still have a lot of room to develop. Mm -hmm. There's many people who hear Taiwan and only think of TSMC. Mm -hmm. Not that TSMC is, is, is not our, what our pride, mm -hmm. but we have much more okay. to offer okay. uh, in liberal de democracy, in our countering the infodemic without takedown, countering pandemic without lockdown, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of different contributions uh, Taiwan can help. Mm -hmm. So it's not just hardware manufacturing. So okay. I think a lot of international branding and image is what we can work on. And that, for me, uh, is even more important than any sort of de jure uh, independence. And even if you are working for de jure independence, that's kind of a requirement for de jure independence because I would recognize, um, you know, mutually uh, from the international community and Taiwan's contributions. Right. Yeah. I, I think recognition is, you know, it's an important point. Really, <clears throat> but how to how to achieve greater recognition? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's it, it's not so easy. I mean, you you mentioned Taiwan being confused with Thailand. Well, mm -hmm. I had someone just a few days ago make that mistake. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, how how does Taiwan actually achieve greater recognition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it's twofold. First is as in like Taiwan can help that us, which is not even a government website; it's a crowdfunded website. Uh, they basically collect everything they can about the Taiwan model to counter the pandemic and offering kind of epicenter to epicenter, working with uh, YouTubers and so on to get the Taiwan model out, especially the critical part about how Taiwan nowadays still make 12 million masks per day and we can export easily 2 million masks per day, an automated factory anywhere in the world mm. if you want that. And so that's part of the uh, message that the civil society is offering the world. Basically, if you're still struggling with the coronavirus, there's at least some parts in Taiwan model that we can help and we're willing to help. Uh, in fact, we have a list of people in Taiwan can help that us uh, that's dedicated their uncollected mass quota for international humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. and, and they are now in the numbers of almost 700,000 now, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, together donated more than uh, the quota of 5 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fun thing is that uh, you can see it um, exactly who. So, so half of the people decide to remain anonymous, mm. but half of people decide to show your name. So if you type in my name, uh, you can see exactly how many masks 
did I dedicate, uh, which is 36, but it's not really 36, it's just six for me. Mm. Uh, but other people who share part of my name <laughs> dedicated uh, their, their masks okay. uh, quota. So, so this is the first branch. This is civil society, social sector, YouTuber, and so on, getting the story out, getting mm. the message out. Mm. And the second, which is more traditional, like official track, uh, for example, um, for the um, um, International Democracy Forum, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, uh, just gave a speech there virtually. Uh, before the WHA, we hosted our own kind of pre-WHA mm. mini-lateral meeting with 14 jurisdictions mm. uh, and through the Global Cooperation <coughs> Training Framework with Japan and US and other host countries, we do focus workshops on infodemic and things like that. Mm. And so uh, circular economy and so on. So for all these mini-laterals, um, Taiwan gets um, a lot of stage to, to offer concrete help mm. uh, instead of focusing our energy solely on nearly 200 countries big multilateral uh, where Taiwan traditionally have very little room to navigate uh, starting this year we're focusing more on unilaterals and multi stakeholder forums. Oh, okay. I, one person I interviewed who he he's doing video production and mm. he's he's produced videos for Discovery TV, mm. National Geographic, mm. uh, and a lot of them introducing Taiwanese cuisine, that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. I, I, I thought that he had a very interesting comment about you know winning more recognition for mm. Taiwan. He he said that he feels that it's it's not really important to have a lot of friends it's more important to have just a few very good friends mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i guess that depends on whether you're an extrovert or an introvert okay but if you're an introvert you prefer a few very good friends okay uh, because meeting with a lot of people during sit down mm -hmm. but if you're an extrovert then the larger the party the better okay right? uh, and, and so i think it both are important mm -hmm. um, the general population from like a random country a random um, human being if they associate Taiwan with something nice, something warm, um, something, for example, we dedicate a mask or we send out medical supplies, we help the agriculture there within Ethiopia, they still remember how we uh, refined their uh, rice and productions and so on. Uh, of course, that's generally good. Mm -hmm. But uh, I agree that it's also important to have a few very good close allies mm -hmm. that share the common values and work on common projects together. Yeah. Well, it, it certainly helps when uh the the White House holds a press conference and, and the masks they're wearing yeah. say yeah, made in yeah, Taiwan. Yeah, they, they all say uh, made in Taiwan, <laughs> right, right, right here. Right? So it's kind of a assurance on the quality. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I think I just have one more question okay. which was not on the list, sure. but I just read yesterday that uh, that uh, Taiwan is going to establish a digital ministry. Is, is mm -hmm. that correct? That's correct. Okay. Or will you be the the, the minister of that digital no, ministry? No, I, I, I will uh, help in getting the plan out. Okay. But uh, because uh, this is already ready the budget session, mm -hmm. so which means that even if it passes this upcoming session, mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean the um, very eventful emergency session right now, I mean the regular session afterward, uh, the new ministry would not run because it wouldn't have a budget mm -hmm. for, for next year. Mm -hmm. So the earliest it could run uh, is actually the year after the next. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, and so for the next year and a half, uh, we'll have uh, a lot of contributions from legislators also, mm -hmm. uh, how the digital ministry should work. Mm -hmm. Because although it's a presidential promise, it's a uh, campaign promise from Dr. Tsai ing -wen, it's also something pretty much all the parties feel as necessary to do. So they'll probably have a lot more inputs mm -hmm. uh, into the, the act. So from the administration, of course, I can't say, uh, you know, what it will look like because it has not passed even the first reading mm -hmm. in the legislation. Mm -hmm. And once it does pass, uh, hopefully in the next uh, regular session, then we can talk more about how to allocate a budget, how to make sure the personnel work and things like that. But that will take place next year. Okay. Okay. Well, I think my time's up. So thank you so much okay. for your time. Really good questions. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh,